thank you for coming. This is obviously a very difficult topic and one that not everybody feels comfortable looking at. But since we are a democracy, uh, it's important to keep in mind that certain things have to happen in order for democracy to be vital. And among those things are transparency and accountability. Right? So it's very important uh, to make sure that the government is held to its own standards. And that means that the government itself does not break its own laws or does not violate the US Constitution. My name is Ute Ritz-Deutsch. I teach in the history department here. I am also the faculty advisor for the Amnesty International student group here on campus. I'm also the uh, group coordinator for the Ithaca chapter of Amnesty International and work within the organization in a volunteer leadership in many different roles. Uh, my academic expertise is on human rights, so I do this inside the classroom as well as outside. This picture here is from a protest on January 11th, I think it was two, maybe three years ago, which always takes place every year, January 11th, in Washington, D.C., because January 11th of 2002, right, a few months after 9-11 happened, January 11th, 2002 was the first day when prisoners on, uh, captured in the war on terrorism arrived at Guantanamo Bay. So for activists who wish to close the facility, this is an annual anniversary that comes up and several groups are involved in, um, in protesting on that day. And this particular image is taken in front of the Supreme Court. So it is a little bit strange that the US should have a naval base in Cuba. And the history of that goes back to 1898 and the Spanish-American War, which nowadays we refer to it as the War of 1898 in recognition of the fact that it wasn't just US Americans and the Spanish who fought in the war, but that you also had Cubans and Puerto Ricans, you had Latino people fighting for independence from Spain, right? And, and the title Spanish-American War does not really give a tribute to that. So the War of 1898, uh, needless to say, Spain lost the war, but also what happened is the people who fought for independence from Spain, and of course it depends on which country specifically you look at, but uh, their it, their quest for sovereignty was also thwarted, and, and the U.S. was very heavily involved in that in terms of uh, dictating the writing of the uh, Cuban Constitution uh, and so on. And then within a few short years, uh, we have a measure that basically uh, forces Cuba to give over part of its sovereignty, and that includes ability to engage in foreign relations uh, and also access to uh, Guantanamo Bay to the United States. And that's why we have... Uh, a military base in Guantanamo uh, in Cuba, which one would normally assume is not our territory. But because of the way things have happened, the courts have ruled that we have not only uh, de facto uh, jurisdiction, but also de facto sovereignty, right? Because one of the things that the Bush administration was arguing is that, well, since it's in Cuba, the U.S. Constitution and U.S. laws don't apply. But the U.S. Supreme Court has struck that notion down. So, but that's why I'm bringing it up here now. We do have de facto, right, in fact, uh, a, a jurisdiction down there. Uh, for some time, Guantanamo was used as a detention facility when uh, Haitians who were trying to come by boat uh, to Florida and to reach the United States were intercepted and detained at Cuba, right? So before it became a detention facility for terror suspects, uh, it was used as a detention facility for Haitians. There was great paranoia that Haitians were bringing uh, HIV AIDS into the country, so that was kind of part of that uh, paranoia. And as I mentioned, January 11th, uh, 2002, was the first day that prisoners caught in the war on terror arrived uh, at Guantanamo. So there are several problems with Guantanamo and the way in which the United States conducts its operations there. Uh, very important for those of us involved in human rights issues is that prisoners were stripped of legal rights and some of them were held for years, some for more than a decade, without ever being charged and without being able to defend themselves. 
and if you remember U.S. Constitution, if you remember Bill of Rights, due process is one of the key rights that all of us here in this country enjoy, and the U.S. Constitution does not distinguish between U.S. citizens and non-citizens, right? Due process rights apply to all persons in the country. So that is very important that those rights have not been extended uh, to prisoners. Uh, many prisoners were tortured in order to get confessions. Uh, needless to say, that is a human rights violation. And sadly, more than 90% of the prisoners who were held in Guantanamo since 2002 ultimately could not be tied to terrorism. So even information published by the US government concedes that they were never Al-Qaeda operatives. And that's a real issue. I think in popular imagination, a lot of people believe Guantanamo is necessary. We are holding the worst of the worst down there. It's making our country more safe. But the bottom line is more than 90% of people who ended up there could not be tied to terrorism. And that's a huge issue, not only legally, morally, but also it raises questions about security and whether or not uh, these types of actions uh, and, and keeping Guantanamo open is actually in our best security interest. Right? And, and many people have argued that that is indeed not the case. So uh, the US, in the way in which it operates Guantanamo, in the way in which prisoners have been treated and the way in which their rights have been violated, is not only in violation of domestic law, meaning US law and the US Constitution, but it is also in violation of international law. Furthermore, from abroad, right, Guantanamo is seen as a symbol of US torture and lawlessness. In other words, to the international community, it looks like the United States just does whatever it wants to do, and if it does not want to comply to international law, then it's not going to comply to international law. Right? So, so there's this notion of um, the United States doing whatever it is it wants and willy-nilly violating principles that during other time periods uh, they will call other states on the carpet for. So for example, over you know, the 20th century, the State Department has routinely criticized other governments for their lack of transparency, for their lack of accountability, for torturing people, for not giving people due process, right? So it, it looks really bad from the eyes of the international community looking at us that we keep Guantanamo open. And, and therefore, the US has lost considerable credibility. The US, for some period of time, was actually considered a champion of human rights or a country that would defend human rights, not just of US citizens, but you know, generally of human rights of, of all people. And, and that image has been severely eroded uh, since 9-11. Uh, sadly, also, again, from a merely security point of view, because Guantanamo is open, because everybody in the rest of the world knows what goes on in Guantanamo, even though here in this country we may not like to look at it anymore and we'd like to ignore it and forget about it. Um, the bottom line is everybody else knows what's going on in Guantanamo, and therefore, in some parts of the world, this is used as a tool to recruit terrorists. Right? So again, in terms of our own national security interest, it's not a good thing that we keep Guantanamo open. Guantanamo by numbers. Okay, what are we talking about here? Over the years, and again meaning since uh, January of 2002, we have had 779 prisoners that were held at Guantanamo. Uh, early on, even during the Bush administration, it became clear that most of them could not be tied to terrorism. So already under the Bush administration, 532 of them were released. Uh, under the Obama administration, a further 90 prisoners have been released. So we have almost 800 people who were held. All right, the military commissions only successfully prosecuted 1% of all the people that came through Guantanamo. There were eight people that were successfully prosecuted, and four of them have since then been sent back to their home country. Um, three are still at Guantanamo uh, serving sentences after the military commission proceedings. When you look at how people were captured 
it becomes very apparent what the problem was right from the get-go. Right? Of all the people who ended up in Guantanamo, only 5% were captured by American troops. More than 86% were reportedly turned over to American forces because there was bounty money to be had. So a lot of times if you have very poor villagers, they're approached by uh, US forces, they're offered money. You know, this, this money could help the community. And if there are in that area people who are not locals, it is very convenient to just say, oh, these people have terrorist ties, we'll get them off our hands, we get some money for it. Right, so the vast majority of people who ended up in Guantanamo ended up there because somebody fingered them, because somebody accused them, and at the time there was an insufficient mechanism in place by the military to actually sift through and figure out who really could have terrorist ties and who did not. Right? So th there was not a sufficient screening uh, mechanism in place. People ended up uh, in, in Bagram or Abu Ghraib, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq, and then were ultimately transported uh, to Cuba. So consider this, right? 86% of the people were handed over for reward money. And 92% of all the people in Guantanamo could not be tied to terrorism. I think there is a direct connection here. It is not a coincidence that most of the people who were handed over to us because they were given cash for that information, right? We're not actually people tied to terrorism. So the bottom line is, unlike what a lot of people in this country believe, that at Guantanamo, really, the worst of the worst are held, and by keeping people at Guantanamo, this country becomes more safe. The truth of the matter is that anybody could have been picked up just by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Who is still left there? At, at current, so these are statistics from uh, January 2014, published by the American Civil Liberties Union. According to their figures, we still have 154 prisoners left at Guantanamo, and about half of them have already been cleared for release. That means the military commission signed off, the State Department signed off, the Justice Department signed off, right? All, all of the uh, important involved US government agencies have signed off. These people have been cleared for release, but they're still at Guantanamo. Why is that? Well, when President Obama ran uh, for election with, during his first presidency, one of the things he promised is to close Guantanamo. And basically, Congress made that impossible by refusing to fund the transfer of prisoners. Right? So a lot of times in Congress, that's how it works. By allocating money or by refusing to allocate money, Congress oftentimes has the last say if it doesn't like how certain policies uh, are going. Right? So that was, one, that was one of the problems. Keeping those 70-some people in Guantanamo is costing us almost $160 million a year if we were bringing these people to the US mainland and if we were keeping them at federal detention facility, that cost would be 2.6 million. So even if you don't care about people's human rights, but if you do care about where your tax dollars go, then this might be something you're interested in, right? We're spending a tremendous amount of money at Guantanamo and quite frankly, it is not necessary. Our federal detention facilities are more than capable to incarcerate even the most hardened criminals, and that includes terrorists, right? But there is a real resistance among the population to have people transferred up here to the mainland of the US. There are approximately 45 prisoners that the US government acknowledges it does not have enough evidence to successfully try and, and convict. But the US government also believes that these people are too dangerous to release. You know, so in other words, they're going to be in limbo indefinitely. Uh, what would be legally the just way to deal with it? I mean, you either have to bring people to trial or you have to let them go. You cannot hold them for a decade without even charging them. And then if you have people you held for a decade at Guantanamo, and while they were held at Guantanamo, you tortured them, well, it's not a surprise that you then conclude 
these people are too dangerous to release. I mean, even if you were innocent to start with, after 10 years in unjust detention and being tortured, yes, at that point you may well pose a security risk. But again, if we're looking at legal principle, it does not justify a state to therefore indefinitely detain people, right? So it, it's a real dilemma um, what, what is going on here. In terms of demographics, and again going all the way back to 2002, the prisoners who were at Guantanamo came from 22 separate countries. And most recently, there was basically a restriction on releasing prisoners to go back to Yemen. And again, these were prisoners who have been cleared, right? Where the government had said, okay, we looked at all the evidence. There's no evidence they're tied to terrorists. They're free to go. But they've been kept at Guantanamo. And, and Yemen was a country that the United States feels is a hotbed for terrorism. So there was basically a restriction that President Obama just recently lifted, right? So right now, we still have predominance of Yemenis in Guantanamo, but they're in the process of hopefully getting cleared out of there. Youngest prisoner, 13 years old. Oldest prisoner, 89 years old. Number of children, I'm assuming that's under the age of 18, uh, 21. We've kept 21 children in Guantanamo. And the youngest suicide was a young man captured at age 16 and uh, committed suicide at age 21. In terms of prisoner treatment, the number of FBI agents who reported abusive treatments, now not the number of agents who've been accused, right? The number of agents who reported abusive treatment of prisoners in Guantanamo is over 200. In fact, the government engaged in its own internal investigations and what was going on at some of the CIA black sites and what was going on at Guantanamo made the FBI uncomfortable and unwilling to participate in some of these interrogation techniques. So over 200 FBI agents have come forward and has said, you know, what goes on down there uh, constitutes uh, abuse and torture. A number of prisoners that we know have been tortured in CIA prisons before they were transferred to Guantanamo. That's at least 26 that we know of. The number is probably higher than that. A number of prisoners who died, at, uh, and again, these statistics are from January, uh, is nine. Nine people have died in custody. Uh, seven have committed suicide, and with the other two, it was health-related. Now, it's not just the FBI who's had an issue with the way in which uh, people were interrogated and treated at Guantanamo. We also have military prosecutors. These are career officers, right, people who've been in the military, uh, they, they have law degrees, uh, they were operating as military prosecutors who were originally assigned, you know, as part of the military commission. As of 2008, seven of them have resigned in protest, saying that the proceedings at Guantanamo are unfair and do not meet uh, standards of, of justice, right? And I mean, that, that tells you something, right? It's not just civilians complaining. It's not just people who are involved in human rights groups or other NGOs who are complaining. We've had people from within the military complaining about what goes on in Guantanamo. There's been a lot of controversy about the way in which the military commissions are run. And here's the problem. If you're tried before military tribunal, okay, the prosecutor and the judge is the same person. And the defense lawyer that you are going to get is also within the military. And the defense lawyer that you get is oftentimes not given any evidence that may give a non-guilty verdict. Right? In other words, the government sits on evidence that may prove that you're innocent, will not share that with your attorney. Right? The, the prosecutor bringing uh, a case before you and the judge is often the same person, right? Evidence is suppressed. In other words, uh, if the government does not want to share evidence, all the government has to say is it's in the national security interest of the United States to not reveal this evidence, right? It, but you, as a defendant, don't even know what this evidence is that is in secret presented against you. And in the beginning, of course, most people did not even have any attorneys to start with, right? No legal representation. 
There is a legal princi principle known as habeas corpus, and that's the right to uh, see a judge to challenge your detention. In, uh, a, a cr if you're criminally charged here in the United States, right, the government has so many hours by which to charge you with. Um, and if, if the government does not have enough evidence to charge you with, then you, you are to be released. People held at Guantanamo, some have been held there for 10 years without ever even being charged. Right. So the military commission so far has only successfully convicted eight people. And again, that's of 800 that have you know, come through Guantanamo since 2002. Out of those, uh, six of them were plea bargains. Uh, one trial was contested. One defendant chose not to participate uh, in his trial. And as I mentioned earlier, four of those convicted have been transferred home. The cost of military commission just in 2013 alone was $116.3 million. That's for one year. And again, in over a decade, we only managed to prosecute eight people. There's a lot of resistance in this country about bringing Guantanamo detainees up here to mainland United States to try them in federal court. But the truth of the matter is that federal courts are more than adequate to deal with terror suspects or anyone else. In fact, number of terrorism suspects prosecuted by federal courts since 9-11 is more than 500. Okay, so compare that. Military commission successfully convicted eight. Federal courts, right, prosecuted 500. Clearly, the federal government is perfectly capable to hold such proceedings, perfectly capable to make sure that things are secure and, you know, that you don't have any terror attack, for example, while proceedings are taking place. So the courts have been more successful in prosecuting terror suspects than the military has, but so far, the number of Guantanamo prisoners who were transferred to federal courts is one, right, one person only. And just as an aside, I would like to, to remind people here that if evidence has been obtained through torture, such evidence is not admissible in a court of law. So if a prisoner in Guantanamo has been tortured, the government, and, and again, the government keeps a lot of evidence secret, may try to use that in the military uh, tribunals. The bottom line is this type of evidence cannot be used in federal court. Right? And it is well known, not just within law enforcement, but in other fields as well, that testimony obtained under torture is re unreliable, right? So it's not only uh, inadmissible in a court of law, but it is also unreliable, right? So in terms of getting intelligence from people, it's just not reliable to torture people because they want the torture to stop and they're gonna give you whatever information they think that you want to have, right? It's just unreliable and that, that's common knowledge. Violation of prisoners' rights. As I mentioned before, many of them were arrested on hearsay, and there was no effective screening mechanism in place. And in this country, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. And that was certainly not the case with prisoners in Guantanamo. They were all automatically presumed guilty. They were kept without being charged. Many of them uh, were not giving access to, to attorneys. Uh, and then again, in addition to that, they did not have access to the evidence. If you are uh, just a, a regular person over here and you are charged with a crime, the government has to produce the evidence against you. Your defense attorney has a right to take a look at that evidence. And that is not happening here. The physical and psychological mistreatment, that has been well documented. Uh, in the very beginning, the uh, International Red Cross had access, uh, maybe not from the very beginning, but the International Red Cross was one of the earliest organizations to have access to Guantanamo and to write reports about the way in which prisoners were treated and found a whole range of abuses. So the earliest reports that we have about human rights abuses in Guantanamo come from the International Red Cross. Needless to say, in the beginning, the Bush administration was very intent on keeping everything secret, right? So all of uh, anything having to do with the war on terror was shrouded in, in secrecy. It took years, right, for pushback from, from NGOs to, to get 
you know, some information released. So uh, among the mistreatments are stress positions, temperature extremes, right, keeping people in extreme cold or extreme hot temperatures, sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation or bombardment. So uh, some people, for example, may have a loudspeaker blaring unpleasant music at them to the point where it drives them crazy. So it, either sensory deprivation or bombardment, beatings, sexual abuse, interference with religious practice. In the beginning, it was a real issue with uh, uh, soldiers uh, basically desecrating the Quran. You know how that is with religious books. You, you want to respect people's religious books, right? So if you desecrate that, um, it, it definitely uh, is going to cause a, a reaction, right? And it, it is an offense that is greater than if, if you destroy or desecrate just any other book, right? So desecration of the, the Quran. Uh, some people were uh, exposed to attack dogs uh, and then force feeding. And that was recently, just in the last year, a big issue because we had Guantanamo detainees go on hunger strike. They went on hunger strike and it's kind of interesting because hunger strike in and of itself can be seen as a First Amendment right, it's your freedom of expression. In protest, as a political prisoner, right, you refuse to, to take food, but then the government, the US government resorted to force feeding. And so that was an issue, uh, not just because of force feeding in and of itself violates their right to protest, but also the way in which force feeding was done, which sometimes was really just from a, a health perspective, a disastrous, right? So for example, uh, pumping, uh, people full of water to the point of bursting, and sometimes that can even damage your internal organs, right? So there's been a lot of protest about uh, the force feeding that has recently gone on in Guantanamo. Uh, and I actually do also have uh, an article here, if you're interested in, from waterboarding to water curing, Guantanamo detainee first to legally challenge force feeding. So this is an article from March of this year uh, for the first time ever, a U.S. court will consider a detainee's allegations of torture and abuse at the military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Um, I would not be surprised that we're going to see future lawsuits resulting uh, from that. Now, torture according to the law. Uh, torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment is unconstitutional and also in violation of the Geneva Conventions and the International Convention Against Torture. Also, torture is not allowed under the United States Army Field Manual. And that is why we actually had the Military Judge Advocate General Corps speaking out against these techniques, and this was all the way back uh, under the Bush administration still. So again, it's not just a bunch of human rights activists being upset about what goes on in Guantanamo, it is government officials and including, in this case, the Judge Advocate General Court that said, hey, wait a minute, what goes on here is in violation of our own rules, right? Uh, and, and they protested against that. So we have the Bill of Rights protecting due process for all persons, not just US citizens. We also have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These are the 30 articles I told you about. Uh, they were first adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 1948, and these 30 articles uh, very broadly protect <clears throat> human rights of, of all persons, right? So coming out of the, the Holocaust, coming out of that realization of World War II, something has to be done to protect all people. Uh, coming out of that, you get this articulation of the 30 articles, and then uh, following that are, are major conventions that embody these principles in law. Right? And once you get the conventions, we have two major ones uh, that were first introduced in 1966 and then went into force in 1976. You have the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which the United States signed on to and therefore is beholden to it. Right? It's a treaty obligation that we have. Um, another one of the major conventions is the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, but sin and the United States has not ratified that one. But since then, we've had a whole range of other conventions dealing with specific topics, 
and one of them is the torture convention, which the U.S. has signed, right? So uh, in the International Convention on Civil Political Rights, particularly Article 6, 7, 14, and 16 apply. Uh, and, and again, the Geneva Conventions, right, dealing with uh, warfare, rules and regulations dealing with warfare, uh, the United States is also legally obliged to. Uh, then we have uh, international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict. And again, the Convention Against Torture, right, the United States has signed on to that one, has ratified that. So international humanitarian law basically says, in the context of an international armed conflict, a civilian who is at the relevant time directly participating in hostilities may be lawfully targeted for attack and kill if, if the attack complies with international humanitarian law. So what that means, first of all, you need to have a war that is recognized by the international commun community as such. And the war on terror or the war on terrorism does not really uh, comply with those standards. Right? Because normally, to be considered a legitimate war, you're talking about war between two states or between two governments. And Al-Qaeda, or you know, the terrorist group, is not a government representing a state. Right? So in terms of legality, there was that issue. US Congress never officially declared war. Right? So it, from a legal, technical point of view, uh, the war on terror is not legitimately recognized as a war. But uh, if we had a legally recognized war, and you have a civilian fighting back, and let's say you have a civilian who's willing to, to kill soldiers, well, yes, that civilian can be held accountable, right? And that civilian can be what the government refers to as, quote, unquote, neutralized, right? However, and this is very important, if there is doubt as to whether a person is a civilian, the person is to be considered a civilian. In other words, if you don't know whether or not a person is a civilian or a combatant, you have to start with the assumption that the person is a civilian. You cannot assume that the person is a combatant. And furthermore, all feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and in any event to minimize incidental loss of civilian life. Okay, going back to the fact that 86% of all the people turned over to the US military were turned over because of reward money, you can definitely see that this principle of feasible precaution was not met, right? So what happened here after 9-11, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the US Patriot Act. That went into force in October of 2001. In other words, very rapidly, not one person in Congress actually read the whole thing from beginning to end. Right? They just had staffers flying through it and briefing them on the content. Uh, also what happened shortly after 9-11 is the so-called authorization to use military force. And it's that particular statement that uh, provides the foundation for this, what's been referred to as the global war theory. Right? Now, while President Bush was still in power, and in these early days after 9-11, uh, what happened is that the Bush administration refused to recognize people caught uh, in Afghanistan, we went into Afghanistan very quickly, uh, people caught in Afghanistan were not recognized as prisoners of war, nor were they recognized as civilians. And that's an important point, because according to international law, if you are a prisoner of war, there are certain rules and regulations in, in how you have to be treated. So for example, you have to be judged by a competent tribunal, right? Now, okay, if you're not a prisoner of war, then you need to be treated as a civilian. And there is a, a different set of rules, and many of the rules are overlapping in terms of how civilians have to be treated. Now, what the Bush administration was arguing, that people we pick up in Afghanistan don't fall in either of those categories. Instead, they are considered uh, enemy combatants. In other words, the administration created a third and separate legal category that actually has no foundation in domestic or international law. But that's the legal justification that the government was using to not give people any due process rights. 
So the authorization to use military force, and again, September 18, just a week after 9-11, that public law was passed, and it authorizes the president to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attack that occurred on 9-11, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons, end quote. Now, the problem here is that there is no limit in terms of time or geography. This basically gives the power to the U.S. president and any subsequent presidents to do whatever he deems fit for as long as he deems fit to basically pick up people in all corners of the world, even if it is outside a conflict zone. Right? I mean, normally, okay, if you have a war and you're in that territory, and you capture someone and that person's a prisoner of war, you know, that takes place in a very defined geographical space. It's, it's in a war zone, right? It's in a conflict zone. This is worded so vaguely and so broadly that it gives, in, in essence, unlimited power to the president. And, and so this is what is being used uh, for this um, uh, global war, uh, the global war paradigm. Now, the Supreme Court itself recognize that what is going on, what the federal government has been doing since 9-11 is unconstitutional. So we had one Supreme Court decision in 2004, Rasul versus Bush, that uh, found that the federal courts indeed have jurisdiction to hear uh, habeas corpus cases. In other words, prisoners at Guantanamo, who are not U.S. citizens, can take these challenges to a U.S. federal court. Right, and there was this big back and forth in whether or not uh, federal courts uh, have the right or jurisdiction to hear these cases, but the Supreme Court uh, decided, yes, indeed, right, the, the federal courts can hear habeas corpus cases. And then in 2008 with Wumi Dien v. Bush, uh, that right was uh, confirmed or reaffirmed. And also, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the Military Commission Act itself is unconstitutional, right? Um, we all know Obama promised to close Guantanamo, and we all know that that so far has not happened. But what is important is that uh, we have uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, also known by its acronym NDAA, and that basically uh, every year provides funding for defense, and that includes uh, Guantanamo. And what happened uh, at the end of 2011, when uh, the NDAA for 2012 was signed into force, so you know Congress passes it, the president signs it into force, that particular version uh, basically codified indefinite detention. So the stuff that was done during the Bush administration, again, to pick up people no matter where they are in the world, they don't have to be in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, they can be anywhere, and then to hold people indefinitely without charging them. That has now been codified into law. So in that sense, uh, things are, are even worse than they used to be. Uh, again, the National Defense Authorization Act is a federal law specifying the budget and expenditures of the United States Department of Defense. And each year, Congress includes certain provisions, right? And for the longest time, the uh, provisions were included in NDAA Provisions were included that prohibited the transfer of people from Guantanamo. So that, that was a, a, a real issue. And, and so with the one that was signed in, in 2011 and then uh, you know, went into force in 2012, um, it basically authorized the president and all future presidents to order the military to pick up and indefinitely imprison people captured anywhere in the world far away from a battlefield. Now, from NGOs, uh, human rights groups, we have uh, you know, several uh, lists compiled in terms of what the harm being done is. And uh, we have uh, here from Amnesty International a list of 10 anti-human rights messages that Guantanamo continues to send. Number one, 
The whole world is a battleground in a global war in which human rights don't apply. Number two, humane detainee treatment is a policy choice, not a legal requirement. Number three, even detentions found unlawful by the courts can continue indefinitely. Number four, the right to a fair trial depends on where you come from and the domestic political temperature surrounding your case. Number five, justice can be manipulated to ensure the government always wins. Number six, execution is acceptable even after an unfair trial. Number seven, the victims of human rights violations can be left without remedy. Looking forward means turning a blind eye to truth and accountability, even in the case of crimes under international law. And then uh, number nine, respect for universal human rights can be discarded if they conflict with quote unquote domestic values. And number 10, double standards, not universal standards, are the order of the day. So NGO activism, there have been a number of groups, uh, this is just a partial list of them, but uh, among the groups in, involved in this uh, struggle to hold the government more accountable, uh, to push for transparency, and then also to push for remedy, have been the Center for Constitutional Rights, the American Civil Liberties Union, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and again, that's just a partial listing. And what these organizations have done and continue to do is uh, publish reports, make statements to the press, uh, organize panel discussions, conferences, interviews, testify before Congress, right? So that's a very important uh, part of all of this. Uh, and then did uh, direct action, as I showed you in the beginning, the picture of the annual demonstration taking place January 11th. And so there's advocacy on the principles, and then there's also advocacy on behalf of individual people. Uh, so for example, Shekhar Amar, who is a, a, a UK, uh, I don't know if he's a UK citizen, but he's married to a UK citizen. He has been cleared for release years ago, and he's still at Guantanamo. The British government has demanded his release numerous times. They want him back in London, right? He has family there, he has kids and so on, and he's still not been released, right? So, so some of the advocacy is, is on behalf of uh, specific individuals. Uh, recent successes, the last round of NDAA, again, National Defense Authorization Act, the one that, was, that Congress passed in late 2013 and that is now in effect for the budget year 2014, that has now a provision that makes the transfer of cleared prisoners uh, easier. And that's huge, okay? So all these prisoners from Yemen who have been cleared but have been sitting there for years, they can now be sent back. Um, the way it goes in Congress, you usually have a bill originating in one of the houses, but then it also has to go uh, and get passed in the second house. So the uh, NDAA originally uh, came from the Senate, and then in the House version, uh, the House voted down another provision that originally the Senate version had, and that would be a provision to transfer prisoners uh, to the United States uh, in order to uh, get tried federally or in order to receive medical treatment, right? So the House has refused on that point. So it's, it's a partial success, but the fact that we now have provisions to basically send home some of those people who have been cleared, and again, keep in mind, if they've been cleared, that means at all levels of government, they have been found not guilty, right? If they've been cleared, then you know we now have the money to, to be able to send them home. Another very important piece the Senate Intelligence Committee recently voted, and this just happened a few weeks ago, uh, recently voted to declassify and release at least parts of the report on CIA torture and black sites. You know, so it's not just Guantanamo, but it's, it's black sites in other parts of the world. And again, in terms of uh, transparency, this is really important, right? Because we, the people, need to know what our government is up to. And in order for us to know what the government is up to, we need to have information. Right? And, and so releasing information that is, uh, you know, previously been held classified is very, very important in this process of transparency and accountability. So prerequisite to peace and security, obviously a lot of people have argued that we need Guantanamo in order to feel safe and secure. Um, many more people have argued that Guantanamo is counter-effective when it comes to that. But, uh, the bottom line is that in order to have peace and security, 
we definitely need to have adherence to human rights and we need to have justice. So what that means is if violations take place, they need to be researched and documented so that we know what we're talking about. We have the stats at our hands. There has to be transparency and accountability and the US government has been really slow with that. Um, and then there has to be a remedy. If you keep someone a prisoner for 10 years, somebody who was innocent, I mean, you would think in the very least after you let them go, you can say, I'm sorry, right? I mean, an apology, that might be a very important first step. Of course, oftentimes with wrongdoing, um, let's say if, if, if someone ended up in, in prison here on a crime and later on they're found to be innocent, sometimes this also involves restitution. Right. The United States government has not apologized to anybody yet, right, to, to none of the 779 uh, who ended up in Guantanamo. And, and there has been uh, a no, no talk of, of restitution. But all of that is kind of important for a process of reconciliation. And then, of course, uh, to, to safeguard future violations. The United States, the most powerful country in the world, the biggest military uh, in, in the world, our military spending alone is more than that of all the other countries on the planet combined. Right? A country that f powerful, I think, uh, should definitely be willing and able to look inside of itself and say, well, okay, we're going to play with an open deck. We're going to be transparent about uh, what it is that we're doing. And we're going to try to remedy some of these violations that have been occurring. Uh, in, in the previous years. And last but not least, and th this may seem like a minor point, but um, you know, for, for a lot of people living in this country when 9-11 happened, it, it seemed to come out of the blue, out of nowhere, and people were shocked and surprised. And um, let me just say, I would never justify any act of terrorism, and I would never uh, justify or excuse what happened in 9-11. But the bottom line is we have had very little discussion about why it happened, and what the grievances are that people have against this country. Right? And, and so that is a broader dialogue that has to happen. If we are concerned about creating enemies abroad, if we are concerned about our long-term future, let's say not just yours, but your children and your, your grandchildren, then we really need to reassess our standing within the international community, what it is that we do that is considered so offensive, and to try and rectify some of these. It's a lot better to make friends uh, in the long run than it is you know, to alienate, because uh, these, these types of acts that we've been engaged in can then come back to, to haunt us.